come around the word of God for just a minute. This is Psalm 121. Hear these words for us today. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade, your shade on your right side. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Where does my help come from today? My help comes from the Lord. Where does your help come from today? Together, our help comes from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's call on them together. Oh, my soul, forget not all his benefits. How his light shone the dark days in this. He has been faithful. He's always faithful Even as I'm walking through the wilderness Standing in the valley I remember this He has been faithful He's always faithful I know where my help comes from My help comes from the Lord I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. My confidence remains in the name above all names. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. Yes, it does. I won't fear.
you too. We trust in him together today. Amen. Let's call on him. Promise maker. This morning has been the faithfulness of God, and I'm reminded of Romans, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. That's who we're going to worship today. I would like to pray. Father, I don't know what darkness people are coming from this past week or month as they've entered into this room to worship together. But Lord, we do know this, that you are greater than that darkness, that you are faithful, and what you promised, you will do. So may you, Holy Spirit, meet each individual where they are this morning with your word and with your presence, and may you lift their eyes to see the faithfulness of you, our good God. 
and may lives be transformed because of it. We pray in Christ's name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, church family, welcome. It's so good to see you this morning and to gather together. Take your phones, if you would, and go to the app and just let us know that you're here. Share your, your prayer requests. If you're with us online, welcome. If you're a guest with us joining online, we are so grateful that you've chosen to view this service and we would love to connect with you. You can text get info to 94000 and somebody from our team will get in touch with you. If you're a guest with us in the room, we are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. As you came in, you were given a gift and a part of that gift had a card, a guest connection card, and we would encourage you to complete that and to uh, let us know that you're here. And again, somebody from our team would love to connect with you this week and see how we can pray for you and how we can be an encouragement to you in your, in your walk with Christ. One of the things that we know is a reality, people might be in this uh, worship service, this gathering, and you're actually new to church. You don't really know what happens at church, and you'd love to know more about what church is. Or maybe you have been in a lot of churches, and you're wondering what Christ church is. And I would encourage you to come this next weekend on Saturday night or on Sunday morning to one of our connection gatherings. And there, you'll be able to hear about the high heartbeat of Christ church, which is for Christ. And we'd encourage you to register and plan on being a part of that. Men coming up on Saturday, May the 13th at 8 in the morning, we'll have our next men's breakfast, a wonderful opportunity to strengthen friendships and fellowship with other men who are seeking to follow Christ and will be an encouragement to you. So register for that. Plan to be here on Saturday morning, May 13th. Well, as we gather, we worship in many ways. One of the ways we gather is through our giving. And so whether you're giving online throughout this week, or if you're giving today in one of the offering boxes in the back, we would uh, urge you to uh, together join your heart with me as we dedicate all of our gifts to the Lord. So Father, we now pause and what we are about to give, we give out of delight and joy in you. We give with a heart that is grateful for how you have given to us all that we need. Lord, we give in faith and anticipation that you will use our gifts to allow us to be a part of the furtherance of the name of Jesus throughout this city and throughout the world. So for the glory of your name we give, and we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tori. One more part of our service before we come back. Uh, to singing praises to our Lord. We're gonna take a few moments now and lay our hands as a pastoral team, a representation of our pastoral team, on Kirk Von Manen. Kirk Von Manen has been a part of our staff now for years. He has actually served in both of our other congregations and is now moved with grace here into the East Valley, which we are very thankful for, to be able to be a part of our hub congregation as uh, he leads us on a church-wide level for global mission and uh, also becomes a part of our family here in the shepherding responsibilities of our church. And I am so thankful for what God has laid out for us. Um, sometimes the rituals that we're given biblically maybe don't make a lot of sense to us, uh, but they are so clear and so clean and so helpful for us. So I'm excited for us to take part in something that goes all the way back to the first church in Jerusalem. As soon as leaders were being uh, pulled out of and identified within the congregation of the people, there was the laying on of hands to commission them to install them into those roles. In fact, it was so important that Paul used it in 1 Timothy chapter 4 to encourage Timothy to be courageous because he had had the hands laid on him. So I'm gonna ask the pastoral team that are here in the room for this service to come on up here and join me. Ask Kirk to come and join us as well. And uh, we are so thankful for the life, the testimony, the influence and leadership of Pastor Kirk. And uh, we're gonna install him by laying on hands. So Pastor Terry Horn's gonna pray over Kirk. Kirk gonna kneel down. If you're a part of our family and you would reach toward us, that would be a blessing. And uh, let's pray our protection and our blessing as we consecrate Kirk uh, to this role. 
Father, we come uh, before you this morning uh, acknowledging that in faith we lay hands on Kirk this morning because you have called him to your work. God, it's a gift uh, to be able to do this together as a local church. And Father, we uh, just acknowledge how you have shown your faithfulness to Kirk through his years of ministry, Father, and, and, and Kirk's faithfulness uh, to your church. And we rejoice in that and praise you for that. And we pray for more of that as uh, Kirk engages here in Gilbert. God, we thank you for the faithfulness of Kirk in his marriage and what that has represented and how that has glorified you over the years. And we pray that you would be with he and his wife, Grace, as they transition here to Gilbert to give their life uh, to ministry uh, for here on, on your behalf. Father, we thank you for the years of fruit that you have shown in Kirk's ministry. God, not just to local congregations, but to ministries around the world. And we pray now that as he engages here, a God, that we would be uh, better stewards of your word and that we would be encouraged in our faith and that we as a congregation would be shepherded because of the way that Kirk serves uh, for your glory here and Gilbert. Father, it's a gift. We're so thankful for Kirk as a brother. And we pray now that as he engages this way, Father, that you would uh, work through him. God, that you would uh, grow him in humility and dependency upon you by the power of your spirit. We pray these things for the glory of your name. Amen. 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 Can we praise the Lord for what he's doing among us? Amen. We are better for it, having Kurt Van Mon and a part of our team. I love you, Kurt. Our worship ministry has been working on a new album and uh, new songs for the church that you would have all week and on our weekend, and we wanted to teach you a new one. This song is called The Cure.
redeemer, for his promises came true. My faith has a foundation, oh my confidence is sure, the hope of my salvation, it is Jesus Christ the cure.
What a mystery, holy, holy God, that we would rejoice in your holiness. What an absolute wonder that we would be singing praises about your holiness. Born as unholy people, creatures under the creator who is holy, your holiness has only cause for terror and dread. But your grace has broken through. Your son has come for our salvation. Your spirit is present in us who have placed our faith in him. And we now are your people, sons and daughters, fully adopted, co-inheritors with Christ who rejoice in your holiness, who rejoice in your absolute otherness, moral perfection, perfect justice, perfect love and grace, who are the recipients of your slowness to wrath, your patience and compassion. We are your people and we delight to sing praises to you. How sweet it is to be together. How sweet it is to be reminded of what we have forgotten over the week past. How powerful it is to know the Spirit's work as he speaks to us and affirms in us and reminds us, renews our thinking, changes our mind in a moment through songs and hymns and spiritual songs. How thankful we are and how eager it makes us now to open your word where your spirit will work yet again. So spirit, we're dependent on you now to help us to understand what we would be confused about, to see what we would miss, illuminate the word, turn the lights on for us, confront us where we are not right. Lead us, lead us, guide us in the truth. The truth will set us free. Your word is truth. So we're submitting together under the authority of this book, Spirit and Power, the gift for preaching, and open our hearts now to receive the word that we might live our lives in the name of Jesus. May it be obvious that we've gathered. As we scatter, may it be clear that we've been with you and we've been with each other. And we pray for these things in faith, believing you are at work among us. Oh, Spirit, we pray that you would draw those that are not yet yours, that you would draw those who do not know you as we know you to Christ, to Jesus today. Do what you've done for us. Open their eyes to their own condition and open their eyes to the glories of what Christ has accomplished. Meet with all of us, we pray now, and we trust you for it. We believe it's in keeping with the design and desire for this service, so we pray boldly in faith. We pray in Jesus' name. If you can agree with that, can you say amen? Amen, you can be seated. So good to see you all. Welcome to Christ Church. And uh, thank you for being a part of our weekend church family. Glad that you have made this a regular part of your life. And uh, if you're a guest or you're relatively new with us, welcome or welcome back. We're glad that you've come. And uh, we've been praying for you. My name is Adam. I serve as uh, one of the pastors here. And uh, really grateful that you're with us today. We're gonna continue our march through John's gospel. We're calling this life in his name because that's why John wrote it. So we believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the son of God and in believing that we would have life in his name, which we unpack. That's actually the passage from last weekend. If you missed out on that, Tori Jaspers, who was hosting our service, did a phenomenal job of unpacking that for our lives. And uh, go back and get that wherever you get our sermon content digitally. And I'm sure that God will meet with you there. It was in chapter 20 at the end that we found John saying that's why he wrote this. So now we move into the final chapter. If you got your Bible, let's all get them out and get them open to John chapter number 21. We're on the home stretch. We're in the final chapter of this fourth of the Gospels. If you didn't bring a Bible today, uh, there should be one underneath of a seat nearby. And I would encourage you strongly to use it. If you're new to the Bible, there's a table of contents in there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John make up the beginning of the second part of the Bible, the New Testament, we call it. And uh, if you get it to John, we're in the very last part of it, and you can meet us there. And don't feel bad that you're coming in John 21. That's totally fine. The Spirit of God works in John 21, just like he did in John 1. And uh, you're only 74 sermons late. 
It's totally okay. There's gonna be more. And every time we engage with the word, God is gonna work. So open up that Bible. And if you don't own a Bible and you're borrowing ours, just take it home. It's a gift. We would love for you to have it in your life as we go forward. Here's the title for our study today. If you're taking down notes, it is Ruined and Running. Jesus has been resurrected. The tomb is empty. But there is one individual whose mind is totally consumed with the reality that the rooster crowed. All Peter could think of in this aftermath was his failure. It consumed him. We know it consumed him. Things were not the way they used to be before the cross, before the horrific events that night that started in the Garden of Gethsemane. Things were not the same. In fact, as Jesus came out of the tomb, he did engage again. He's already engaged twice with his disciples, but it wasn't like the old days. It wasn't where they were nonstop in each other's lives. In fact, when he came to them in the locked room the first time, he told them that he wasn't gonna stay and that he was sending them out as his father had sent him. He hasn't been with them. He came eight days later and he came back into another locked room to engage with them so that he could have his conversation with Thomas, the twin, or doubting Thomas as we cruelly know him. That's what we studied last weekend. Things are not the same. And the disciples now move back toward their home base. They go back up around the Sea of Galilee where they're from. They leave Jerusalem. And I'm convinced that Peter is overwhelmed by what he has done. It's not that Peter doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's that Peter has been so overwhelmed by what he did that he does not believe that he can be useful for the kingdom of Christ on the mission of Christ. In fact, that's what I want you to know this morning as we get ready to enter into John 21. If you think John ends like tapering down, you're wrong. It is so profoundly important to have this at the end of our study of this gospel record. Because mission dies where restoration is not experienced by the ruined and the running disciples. Do you hear me now? A lot of you have not lived for Jesus in the week past. You have not spoken for Jesus. You've not been bold for Jesus. You've not shared the love of Jesus. You've not been on the mission of Jesus to make disciples of all the nations Disciples, making disciples of Jesus because you have not experienced the restoration of your relationship with Jesus in the aftermath of your failure toward Jesus. I've been overwhelmed by this passage. I've been so needing this passage in my life because mission dies where restoration is not experienced. And though things will never go back for Peter to being the one who didn't deny Jesus, there's something powerful that happens now in the restoration of Peter as the one who did deny Jesus. So there's good news for ruined and running disciples. And if you do not categorize yourself as ruined and running, no doubt you will soon. If we are in some delusion that those who are strong are those who do not have sin, we need to engage more with our Bible. The presence of remaining sin means that we will be ones who desperately need this restoration if we don't need it today. And I'm convinced some of you need it right now. That's why you're here. You didn't want to come today, but you came. And God is going to speak to you through John 21. And he's going to remind you that Jesus restores ruined and running disciples. That's what he does. So I wanna read the text with you. We're gonna read the first 19 verses. This is a lot. We've only got one more weekend in John's gospel. I wanna read this for you and I would just encourage you to give it your full attention. It's a fascinating account and it's the word of God. So let's read it now. I'll read it out loud. You follow along silently wherever you are. Verse one, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, 
Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of, others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Are you still with me? Heads up for a minute. Rotate our necks. Back down, verse 15. That's an old people thing to do. If you're young and didn't need to do that, just bear with us. 40 up, you know what I'm talking about. Let's go, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, You used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. These are the precious words of God for us this morning. May the spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten, to be moved by them. Let me get that big idea in front of you one more time. Jesus restores ruined and running disciples. There's good news here. Good news for us, church family. And the simple question is, how does he do it? I think if we just engage with the story that we just read, if we just will give our attention to a few of the details, we will find that there are four, there are four restoration parts of the pattern There's a pattern that's developed here for us to enjoy and to trust in and to hope in and to look for. And I trust that God's spirit will use it to encourage you. So number one, if you're jotting them down, number one, how does Jesus restore? He pursues me when I drift. Now let me just catch you up a little bit. They've gone back up to the Sea of Galilee. That's quite a trek. It's quite a journey from Jerusalem And I kind of enjoy the fact, the Sea of Tiberias, by the way, is the Sea of Galilee. It's all the same. It was on the shore of Tiberias, so it was called by various names. It's the Galilean region, and Tiberias was the main city that was on that lake. So the Sea of Tiberias is the Sea of Galilee. I just kind of find it funny that Simon Peter's name is first. That's not out of the ordinary. That Thomas, the the twin, as John wants to seem to make sure we know to call him, and we keep calling him Doubting Thomas, Nathaniel, that's Bartholomew, he has two names, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee. The sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, the one who's writing it, they're the sons of Zebedee. And then I think it's funny, he's like, and two others of his disciples. Like, really, couldn't come up with the names? 
Those two other guys, they're just like, are you serious? John, this was like our only moment where you put us in and you said two other disciples? You couldn't get Philip out of your pen? You couldn't say, you couldn't say Simon the Zealot? You could put that there? I don't know who they are. But they're there and they're in a home. Perhaps it's Peter's home. And Peter says to them, what we have known was coming, I am going fishing. In the aftermath of the resurrection, in the aftermath of the cross, in the aftermath of the mock trial, in the aftermath of his denial, and in the confusion following it, Peter now has gone back to what is comfortable for him. And I don't think we have to overdo it on this, but I just want you to know he has been called out of this. If we go back to the beginning of John and the calling of Peter, if we go back to Matthew's account of this and Luke's account of it, he is told he will no longer be a fisher of fish, but he will be a fisher of men. Peter does not believe that he is any longer a part of the mission of the Messiah. He does believe he's the Messiah, but he believes that there's no way that's going to be his life. So in the confusion and the delay and the absence, he drifts. He says, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out for the night. Now, those fishermen in the room, this is not going out to fish like we go out to fish in America. If you travel internationally and tell people that we fish and then throw them back, they're like, what? This is fishing for your livelihood. This is to sell these fish to people to eat them and to have food to eat yourself. He's going back to his career. He's going back to what he knows and is familiar with. He's going back to the way he's provided for his family before he left it to become a disciple of Jesus and to live on the mission. They went out, they spent the entire night. In verse four, as dawn is breaking, this is what I want you to notice. Jesus is also on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. That is because Jesus left Jerusalem to go up to see his disciple Peter. I know the others are there, and certainly they got the benefit of being there. But the focus that John wants you to know is that Jesus pursued Peter. He came to where Peter was. He was on the shore. They couldn't see him. They didn't understand who it was. Perhaps it's the low light. Perhaps it's yet another experience of the glorification of Jesus just doesn't compute with their brains. They don't know who they're looking at. He calls them children, which I think is hilarious. Children, that's an insult from some random guy on the shore. You have any fish? They don't know who he is. What I want you to see first, ruined and running disciples. A category that all of us will walk through as sinful humans waiting for the day when the, the removal of the very presence of sin will be our experience in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus pursues us when we drift. Do not mistake the situation. Jesus did not merely sit back in Jerusalem and say, when Peter gets through this processing, I know he'll find me. He knows where I am. He knows where I hang out in Bethany. He knows where I hang over at Lazarus's house. He'll come back down. I know he's gone up to, no, he goes to Galilee. If you've had uh, the situation where you're in a crowd with your kids and watch them drift away from you and start to get confused, start to look around. You can see it on their face. They're looking for you. They're looking for the familiar face and things are starting to get confusing in the crowd. Faces aren't recognizable. They start to feel very small. There's all these people around them that are taller than them. It's one thing for you to sit there and watch them do that and just be like, well, they'll eventually find their way back to me. This is a good life lesson. And if you've done that, I'm not here to judge you. That was terrible parenting though. Anyway, <laughs> something totally different when you go for them. You call their name. You use the whistle. You yell out. You go over to them. You're like, I'm here. I'm right here. You pursued them as they drifted from you. Loved ones, Jesus pursues disciples who are drifting. He is never far away. He's on the shore today. You may not see him. You may not recognize him, but he's been pursuing you because you are overwhelmed with what you've done and the failure is too big and you think that you're on the sideline now of the mission. Mission dies where restoration is not experienced by ruined and running disciples and he pursues us. How sweet is our Lord Jesus to come up to the Sea of Tiberias to go get Peter. 
So look up, drifting disciple. He's there, and he's always been there. That's the first pattern of restoration, first element of the pattern. Here's the second. How does Jesus restore? He reminds me when I forget. Everything that happens now from verse five down through verse 14, really the heart of what we read together is intended to remind Peter. It's to remind him he can't remember things. If you're jotting down notes, write down Luke chapter five, verses one through 11. Everything you're about to read is to to get the memory back for Peter. I don't wanna go back and read all of it again, but I want you to remember that they're out at night. They didn't catch any fish. Jesus is on the shore. He says, did you catch any fish? They say, no, we didn't. He says, cast it on the right side. Spread the net out on the right side of your boat and you'll catch some fish. They do and they can't haul it in. Hello, that's already happened. In Luke chapter five, that's how Jesus called them to be his disciples. This is an object lesson. Jesus is reminding the disciple of what he has forgotten. He was called out to live his life on the mission to make known the glories of Christ in his sphere of influence and abroad. And now he gets this object lesson of this fishing miracle. I love it that John's the first one to put the pieces together, verse seven. The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, that's the way he identifies himself, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord And this is the pivotal moment, right? This is the pivotal moment. Jesus has come after him. And when his eyes finally see, it's Jesus. And when his ears hear from John, it's the Lord. Peter responds, finally, we get a little Peterness out of Peter. He jumps out of the boat. He grabs his outer garment. He's stripped to his waist, tied up to be doing his work out there, casting in, working the nets. He throws on his outer garment and he chucks himself into the water. Somebody came to me last night and was like, Peter was like, if this is another race, I'm winning. (laughs) I don't think that's what's happening. I actually think Peter can't wait to be in the presence of Jesus. I actually don't think he totally understands what's happening in this moment, but he can't wait to be near him. So he does the Peter thing. We're not surprised. He talks and then thinks. He acts and then thinks. He's already jumped out of another boat. He jumped out of a boat in the middle of a storm. Why? Because he asked, can I come to you, Jesus? And you sure, come on out, walk on the water. Gets to the shoreline. And there is a charcoal fire in place. John chapter 18 and verse 18. This is not a little wood fire. This is a charcoal fire because everything here is a memory. It's where he'd warmed his hands on the night of the denial of Jesus. And I love that John says, when we got there, he already had fish cooking. Jesus didn't get them to catch fish because he needed fish. They had fish. He had fish cooking already. He'd go, go get some of yours and add them to mine. I'm already working some over here. I got bread going, bread and fish. Are you kidding The fishing miracle was intended to remind Peter that this was how he was called out in the first place, by the Messiah. And secondly, at the charcoal fire, there are fish and bread already being warmed up so that Jesus, the host with the most, can give them the bread and the fish. Come on, they've been here before. John chapter six and verse 11, Jesus didn't just feed the disciples. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. This is all for Peter. Come on, Peter. Come on, man. Remember, I know you're ruined. I know you're running. But Jesus has come to restore. He pursues in the drift and he reminds when we forget. Open your Bible, disciple, on the run. And you will find him reminding you of what he has taught you in the past and what he has said to you in the past and how he has worked in your life in the past and the power you've seen in the past and the miracles he's done in the past. I've got a really bad long-term memory and I do not want you to diagnose me after the service, okay? Don't tell me. I'll forget what you said anyway. No, I'm kidding. I I don't have that. I just can't remember any faces in my childhood. It's a very odd thing. I... I 
I remember names uh, really well, and I can kind of remember events based on pictures, but I, can't, I cannot remember faces. So my, my mom is very burdened by this. My sister can remember everything. My sister remembers what color socks I had on when I came home from the hospital. She was a toddler. Like, how do you remember that? So my mom has been for a long time trying to get me to remember more, to be more like my sister. I'm okay on the inside. I'm okay <laughs> dealing with it. It's probably not what she's doing. But anyway, my mom will say things to me and she'll say, do you remember that, honey? And I'll be like, no, I don't remember that. And then she'll say, well, you, you do. They were married to so-and-so, remember? And they had that little dog. And I'm like, yep, still don't remember that. <laughs> oh yeah, well, they had the house with the, the, the white siding. I don't remember. But do you know what happens sometimes? My mom will find a box somewhere that she decides does not need to be in her house anymore. She will send it to me. And as I open up the box, I will smell things. Old leather. I'll pick up my old baseball. I'll grab an old trophy from some tournament that I played in. And do you know what'll happen? I can remember. The visual element of whatever it is that she sent, uh, sometimes it just brings the memory back. Jesus is not just saying, hey, Peter, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Peter can't remember. Okay, throw the net on the right side. You'll catch some. Here comes Peter, crashing through the water, 100 yards, he's running, half swimming, half running to get to Jesus, charcoal fire. Fish and bread already on the fire because it was a miracle to bring remembrance and then he delivers to them fish and bread. Why is he doing it? Because sin is devastating. It robs us of our memories. We forget what we know to be true. We forget the words of life that have brought us life. We forget what it means to live life in his name and Jesus restores ruined and running disciples by bringing to memory by sparking the memory, by bringing something deja vu to us. I've been here before. I remember. That's exactly what he's doing. And we will need this. Some of you need this today. You need to be reminded that he restores. And he still intends for you to live for his mission to make disciples in this world, period. In any fallout of the situation, he still intends for you to speak for him, for you to live for him, for you to shine for him in the darkness. That's why you're here. You're a disciple of Christ. And Peter is getting his memory jogged by the circumstances on the shoreline. That's the second part of the pattern. How precious is that? With Peter soaking wet and now sitting by the fire, Memories flooding back of the day he was called to be a disciple. The day that things started to click that this was the Messiah. We come to the third part of the pattern. Number three, how does Jesus restore? He forgives me when I fail. Now maybe you're like me and you tend to be a little cynical. And so when you read this, you're like, man, Jesus is running him through the ringer. Do you love me? And then he sits back, looks at him and goes like, but do you? That's not what's happening here. Do not think that way. He is not doing anything except providing full forgiveness to the failure of Peter. This three-tiered approach is intended to do exactly what it does. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Why does he say that to Peter? Because Peter had said he did. Matthew 26 and verse 33, Peter said, I love you more than everybody else does. I'll lay down my life for you. And now in the aftermath of his failure, that's the last thing on his mind. And Jesus, hey, Peter, look at me. Do you love me more than these guys do? You know, you know I love you. Do you love me? You know I love you. Third time, do you love me? And that's when it hits Peter. The third time would always hit Peter. I was reading an Acts this week at Joppa and as the, the, the whole vision he had about the, remember the blanket coming down and things were gonna change in the new covenant. Three times, I feel like Peter, everything that was a three was Peter was like, oh, but how sweet is this? This is because forgiveness is coming. Do you know what Jesus says in return to him? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I don't make a big deal out of the synonyms that are there if you're a Bible scholar and you're wondering when I'm gonna get to that part. 
There's a lot of, lot of synonyms here. There's sheep synonyms that are used here. There's love synonyms that are used here. There's no synonyms that are used here. That's for the 10% of us who are nerds in Bible study. Just wanted you to know why I'm not doing that, okay? When Jesus says back what he says back, he is providing forgiveness. You be about tending, feeding my people. You be back about what I told you to be about. What Jesus is doing here is he is saying, it's over. It's been covered. And positionally, Peter does not need washed again. Go back to John 13 in your mind. When he's washing the disciples' feet, Jesus is. And Peter goes, no way you're doing that. And he says, if I don't do this, you don't have any part of my kingdom. And Peter goes, well, then give me a bath. Because he's Peter, right? Jesus says, you don't need a bath. You're positionally clean, but you're gonna need your feet washed. And here is Peter needing his feet washed. And he's being forgiven. He's being forgiven in his failure because Jesus pursues him as he drifts. Jesus reminds him as he forgets. And Jesus forgives him in his failure. Feed, tend, feed, lambs, sheep. You know, Peter says, you know, Peter says. And on the third time, he says, you know everything. You're the son of God. You are the Christ it is the very thing he has always said. And Jesus uses his proper name here, Simon, son of John, or Simon bar Jonah, if it was spoken in its original language. That's the name he was given. That's his given name. Do you know that Jesus gave him other names? He called him Cephas. That's the Aramaic version of rock. He called him Peter. That's Petra. That's the Greek version of rock. But he doesn't use his nicknames here because that's not where we are. Oh no, Peter has drifted. Peter has forgotten. Peter is out here in his failure. Peter doesn't think he could ever be a part of the mission again. And he says, Simon, son of John, Simon Barjona, you're gonna be back about what I called you to be about. Because I forgive you. Peter was standing right beside a charcoal fire. Again. And three times, he was being asked a question again. And this time, he was being restored by his Messiah, who was forgiving him. I don't mean forgiving him positionally. He wasn't becoming a Christian. He was being forgiven familially. He was being forgiven relationally. Do you know this is a part of your walk with Christ? Listen, if you've not been living on the mission, it may be because you've not been engaging in what God promises to you in relational, familial Restoration through forgiveness. Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 51. Psalm 32, there's a bunch of them. Psalm 38, Psalm 51. 32 and 51 are almost the exact same psalm. They're David's repentance psalms. 32, 38, 30, uh, 51. Hebrews chapter 12, verses seven through 11. And 1 John 1, 9. How capable is the cross? Church family, how capable is the cross of Christ to cover your sin? How faithful is the forgiver to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness? How sure is your Savior to do his saving work and to hold you fast all the way home? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, but you don't know what I've done. He'll come for you. He'll remind you. And he is always forgiving as you lay before him the reality of your sin. Peter cannot get past his sin. Jesus meets him there and forgives him. And friend, if you don't have a savior, period, then you cannot have a relational walk with Jesus. You have to have Jesus as your savior. You have to be cleansed to get cleansed. You have to be cleansed entirely through faith in him. That's the reality. He came, took human flesh, tempted in every way like us, but didn't sin. Died in substitution payment for all of the sins of all of those who are his people who will believe and rose from the dead three days later so that he conquers sin and death. Therefore, if you'll place your faith in him, he will provide salvation for you. And as you deal with the presence of remaining sin and you deal with the failure in your life as a disciple, he will be faithful to restore you because Jesus restores ruined and running disciples. He'll chase you down. He'll jog your memory. And he will forgive you. Things may not be the way they were before, 
but the mission has not changed. And you are a disciple. Number four, last part. How does Jesus restore? He calls me when I compromise. I gotta think that at the end of verse 17, Peter's eyes aren't looking up anymore. Jesus now says, truly, truly, I say to you, Peter. It's very personal. If you grew up in the King James Version or the King Jimmy, as I like to call it, this is verily, verily, I say unto thee. Remember those words? This was what Jesus used as his setup to like, you gotta hear this. It's like he's clapping if, if you're a part of our family. Hey, wake up. I see you going to sleep. Head down. Peter's eyes are down. The third time hurt. You know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Hey, look at me. Look at me. Truly, truly, I say to you, eyes on me, Peter. Jesus' eye contact moment. When you were young, you used to do what you wanted to do. But when you're old, you won't. Someone will take you where you don't want to go. And John puts in parentheses in verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Peter was restored. He lived for Christ. He lived on the mission and he died for Christ. He was crucified. His arms were tied to a cross beam and he was led out to his crucifixion. He died for the name of Christ. Tradition tells us, maybe legendary, but tradition tells us that he refused to be crucified upright because Jesus died that way. So he requested to be crucified upside down because he was being restored by the Sea of Galilee. And then the most precious words. After saying this, with Peter sopping wet, Looking back at him, he says those two words that Peter had heard years before, follow me. This is the full restoration of Peter. He's back to what he had been before. This is a full and complete restoration. Discipleship is for the mission. And Peter, though he is a disciple and though he is a follower of Christ, had thought himself rendered ineffective for the mission. There's no doubt about it. He doesn't know what well, his life will be like, but he might as well go back to fishing for fish. But he's been called out to be a fisher of men. Disciple of Jesus Christ in failure today. You're aware of your failure. You came in with your failure. You sang through your failure. You're listening to me right now with your failure. Failure is all over you. Hear me now. Jesus pursues you in your drift. He will remind you of what you have forgotten. He will forgive you of your failure. And he is still calling you to follow Follow him. You be with Jesus. You live for Jesus. You say things are all different now because of what I've done. Live for Jesus in the entirely different now because of what you've done. It's for Jesus' sake. It's for Jesus' name. This is what he does. And if you think this is the outlier, Peter's like the exception to the rule. You've misunderstood the scriptures. This is our story. Amen, church? This is our story. Peter's not on probation. He's not on parole. He's been totally pardoned and he has been called back in his compromised position to be a disciple who would live for the purposes of Christ. Jesus restores ruined and running disciples. We come here to learn in order to live. So let me give you three statements that you must have as we leave this text and leave our gathering to scatter on the mission. Number one, I can be saved today. Church family, you can be saved today. You say, well, I'm here, I'm a part of this. Yes, but if you have not known the saving grace of God in your life, you have been around it, but you have not known it. You do not know Christ. You have a growing sense that you are not bearing any fruit because your roots have been unaffected by Christ. You have not received new life I call you to examine yourself and to know that you can be saved today if you will humble yourself, if your eyes are being opened, if the Spirit of God is regenerating you, run to Christ in faith. Friend who would never claim to be a Christian, you know you're not a Christian, you don't follow Christ, you can be saved, your soul can be rescued today, today. Today's the day of salvation. You have no guarantee of another breath, no guarantee of another week. 
Confess your sin, lay down your life, and cry out for salvation, and Jesus will save anyone and everyone from anywhere at any time who calls upon the name, his name, for salvation. Come with us. Say, man, I'm not religious. Yeah, you don't have to be. Man, I've done a bunch of stuff I'm not proud of. Yep, that's our life. That's who you're with. It's not getting cleaned up that brings you to Christ. It's knowing that you're filthy in need of salvation of your soul. I can be saved today. Some of you need to be saved now. Don't harden your heart. Don't stiffen your neck. Don't make an argument to overcome the pull of the Holy Spirit. Number two, church family, this one's really for you. I can be restored today. Right now. Perhaps this has been Jesus on the shore to you. Humble yourself, throw on your clothes, jump out of the boat. It's right here, right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, help. Number three, I can be useful today. Some of you believe, as Peter no doubt did, that you can't talk about Christ because of what you've done to Christ. What validity would there be in my testimony of the power of Christ with the the reality of my failure of Christ? Well, with restoration from Christ, there's profound impact. Humble yourself, believe, and live life in his name this week on the mission in whatever sphere of influence is now yours. Good news. Jesus restores ruined and running disciples. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for this part of your word. And I pray now that you would use it in whatever way needs to be done. I pray for our friends maybe who have claimed to be Christians, to be a part of the church, but have never known the saving grace that they've claimed. I pray that their eyes would be opened now and today would be the day of salvation, that they would be born again. And I pray for our church family that have been rendered ineffective, who've been crippled by our failure, We've gone back to fishing. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would meet us there. Remind us of what we're forgetting. Forgive us of our failure and call us back out of the compromise to live on your mission, that's why we're here. Our hearts want it, your spirit must do it. We trust you for it. Make us useful again this week. In whatever the circumstances are this week, perhaps affected by our sin, I pray that you would make us useful for Christ, that we would follow him, live on his mission. I pray this. In your name, Jesus, because I believe you came out of the grave. I believe you have all the power. You've changed my life. You've changed the lives of our church family. And I trust you for the restoring work that needs to be done now. Thank you in advance. Amen. Well. Sometimes I don't want to just jump out of here. I want to spend a little bit more time. So I don't know how many of you grew up around the church, but we're going to have what we call an invitation. I'm just going to invite you to respond and to interact personally with the Lord because I believe some of you need to be restored today and some of you need to be saved today. 
Maybe you've called this or known this as an altar call. I don't believe this stage is an altar and you're not coming up to it. But I do believe there should be an invitation moment. So I'm gonna have our team, Em's gonna sing over us a song that is just about this. It's about restoring us. It'll give words, but I would invite you to use your body to posture yourself in humility if restoration is what you need or salvation is what you're experiencing. And to use your body would just be to turn there and to kneel down at your seat and to position yourself in humility on your knees while the team sings over us that we might interact with God there. Take this seriously. Linger a bit longer with our faithful Lord Jesus, okay? So if that's where your heart is, I'd invite you to do that. Team, you sing over us. Encourage us with the truth of the restoration of Christ. Man, I trust that 
God's spirit has been at work in us. If we can, why don't we stand? And again, I don't know how many of you grew up around the church, but we're gonna sing the most invitation song chorus ever. I sang this song week in and week out. We're just gonna sing the chorus a couple times. If you know it, sing with Josh. Lord has met with us in a very special way through his word and by his spirit this morning. You maybe spent some time in prayer, but you're like, I need to talk to somebody. We want you to know we are eager and ready to meet with you. We have prayer teams here at the front that want to meet with you. Please come share those burdens. Allow us to minister to you in that way. Maybe you have bigger questions. Uh, we'd invite you to stop by the hub on the way out. And there we have a team and they have lanyards and you can talk to them and, and they can even connect you with somebody if you need to talk with somebody this morning. We truly want you to know that we're ready to meet with you today. If you are a guest and we haven't had a chance to meet you, would you stop by the hub? We would love to, we would love to get a chance to know you before you leave. But as we go, let's go being reminded of this glorious truth that Peter learned and that is this, you are loved.